Hello, everyone. Uh, back to resuming my uh, Q&A videos. And many questions are coming and asking, Ayman, just stop your boring history lectures and what happened and who's at fault and you know what happened 75 years ago and 100 years ago and uh, 20 days ago. Please just tell us where are we going from here? Where this conflict is heading to? How is it evolving? And so I decided I'm going to answer this question. I usually talk about history, but you know, why not the future? is here. Well, actually, the future is not here. The future is never here, actually. The future is always going to happen. Like, you know, so it's going to be here sometime, but it ne we never catch up with it anyway. So here is my crystal ball, and I'm going to consult it somehow. Actually, no, this is you know, a, um, not even crystal. This is uh, some sort of a rubber or plastic or whatever. It belongs to my daughter. It's a toy anyway, so you know, it's useless. However, I have a few scenarios here as to where this conflict is heading to and how it could be contained or let's pray that it doesn't come to never be contained and I will be putting some percentages over the probabilities just in case um, and also in order for you to understand how my uh, how I came to this analysis so first of all um, as we all know that 15 days ago, um, Hamas stormed uh, Israel uh, proper, you know, the 1948 state of Israel. Um, most of the towns and uh, villages, uh, the Israeli towns and villages bordering Gaza uh, were affected. Roughly about uh, 1,400 Israeli military and civilians were um, uh, killed. Um, roughly about 4,500 wounded, uh, many of them are still in critical condition, and about 200 uh, people uh, were taken hostage. Some were military, some were civilians, some were foreign, um, and of course there are some of them who are uh, young, extremely young, and there are some who are old, extremely old. Um, and the hope is that Hamas would see sense and at least release the young and the old. Um, that would be uh, the right thing to do. Now, um, 15 days later, um, what do we have? On the 7th of October, the number of Israeli active troops were roughly about 170,000. Today, however, we have 500 and 30,000 active troops. Uh, that is the highest ever uh, in Israel's history to have you know, this number of active troops and all fully deployed, unlike you know, 170,000 active troops and most of them were not deployed you know, um, you know, on that day. The other thing is that um, to maintain this uh, level of military readiness and to maintain 530,000 people mobilized, at some point they need to be used. Um, and at the moment, something around roughly half of them deployed so in the south of the country, you know, namely Gaza Front, and the other half uh, deployed around the um, northern border, you know, you know with Lebanon. Uh, just in case Hezbollah decide to enter the fray. Now, in a sense, I would say that we are heading into four distinct scenarios here because we have, for the first time in 50 years, a proper declaration of war uh, by the Israelis. Not to mention the fact that the U.S. decided um, to um, join the deterrence um, you know, and uh, decided to uh, deploy two aircraft carrier uh, strike groups uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, the USS Gerald Ford, and within that group you have the USS Normandy, it's an amphibious assault ship, you know, with at least 2,000 Marines uh, ready to de deploy there, as well as the USS uh, Eisenhower. So there is enough firepower there. Um, you know, within that large naval armada to wipe out an entire nation like Syria and add Lebanon, you know, um, uh, for measure. So I would say that the four distinct possibilities that we have are as follows. There is a 20% probability 
that the Israelis will be deterred by the warnings coming out of Hezbollah and Iran. Uh, as you all know, Hezbollah and Iran have more or less um, drawn a red line and saying that we will not accept a scenario where Hamas is completely dismantled and dislodged out of Gaza altogether. So this could um, change the strategy of the Israelis to the point where they will just contend themselves with besieging Gaza from land and sea and continuing the policy of airstrikes uh, until, well, I don't know, like, you know until something happens. Uh, but of course, like, you know, I mean, we know from the conflicts in uh, Yemen and in Afghanistan and elsewhere around the world that um, air power alone does not dislodge any militant uh, organization out of anywhere. Uh, so you need uh, boots on the ground. So, you know, what are the possibilities that it's happening? I said 20%. However, why I believe it is low? Because on 7th of October, 8th of October, more or less the Israeli decision makers took the decision that um, to upgrade Hamas from being a tolerable nuisance to existential threat. And as such, since they have been upgraded to such level, there can no longer be coexistence with them. I mean, the Israelis were able to coexist with them for about 16 years, being in control of Gaza. But I think after what happened uh, on uh, October 7, it's just it's impossible politically uh, for the Israelis to accept any outcome that would see even a broken and wounded Hamas, even if it was a shadow of his former self, still in control of Gaza. So that out of the question for now, but still is a possibility, it's a probability, so we will keep it at 20%. There is another 20% where Israel invade Gaza. They send in the ground troops and call Iran and Hezbollah's bluff, and it turns out they were bluffing. They were just barking dogs on the side. Too much bark and no bite whatsoever. So they go in, and this is where they will focus their ground offensive on northern Gaza, where they will fight neighborhood to neighborhood, street to street, house to house, tunnel to tunnel, until they finally push all the remnants of Hamas militants to the Valley of Gaza, south of the Valley of Gaza, because the Valley of Gaza is almost like in around the halfway between um, in the North Gaza and the Egyptian border. So it split uh, Gaza into two halves. Uh, so in my opinion, I think, and this is just my own speculation, by the way, um, in my opinion, I think the Israeli military will just go all the way to the Valley of Gaza, and then they would offer Hamas two options here. The first option would be the Beirut option, for those who are not, you know, who are millennials and young, and you know, haven't lived through uh, this, not as old as me, and as you can see, like, I mean, I'm getting old thanks to two monsters I have at home. Um, this is what encouraged me to understand the two-state solution. I want two house solutions. Seriously, I want two house, two houses solution. So basically, like, you know, my kids are in one house and myself in another, and that's it. Like, you know, I live happily ever after. However, um, the Beirut solution as far as the Israelis are concerned is that when they invaded Lebanon in 1982 to get rid of the PLO fighters led by Arafat, um, they went all the way to Beirut, the capital of Lebanon. They then pushed them all the way into Western Beirut, known as Sunni Beirut. And there the bombardment that happened was awful. Nonetheless, <coughs> um, ships came from everywhere in order to evacuate Arafat and his PLO fighters, and they sailed never to return to Lebanon. So that was a halfway solution that the Israelis accepted as a compromise, Arafat accepted as a compromise, lived to fight another day. Um, so the idea is that Hamas militants and their families would be offered um, you know, third party country uh, ships in order to sail, uh, let's say into Libya, into Sudan, into Yemen, or even better, Iran, uh, to enjoy some uh, cello, sultani, bar, kebab, or whatever, 
Merza uh, Qasimi. Um, I'm not talking about, of course, the Qasimi uh, Qasim Suleimani who became a kebab. No, I'm talking about, you know, the Merza Qasimi, which is a brilliant starter, you know, for Iranian food. Like, you know, it's made out of, you know, aubergine and yogurt and all of that. It's amazing. But anyway, so um, this option of seeing the Hamas fighters sailing uh, into the sunset. Um, and to live their lives miserably ever after, um, it's likely, it's likely they will take that offer. Uh, if it means uh, sparing the south of Gaza where now the whole population will be concentrated there from a total and utter destruction. Um, but there is a possibility they will just fight to the death, which means that the second option will be the Mosul option. Uh, many of you know that when the international coalition led by the United States and ironically, <laughs> Qasem Soleimani with them, um, were heading towards Mosul in order to clear it from Daesh and its militants. Um, it took months. Between 16 to 25,000 civilians died just to clear 8,000 ISIS militants. That's it. We have in Gaza combined 80 to 90,000 of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad militants. Um, just keep that in mind. Therefore, the civilian casualties out of a grand offensive could be as high, just only in the north of Gaza, as 10 to 15,000. And if they go into south Gaza, I don't want to even think about it. You know, the Egyptians must open the Rafah crossing for everyone who wants to seek refuge, because then the civilian casualties it will be beyond um, uh, the count. Now, this probability is 20% that Israel goes for the ground offensive and, you know, it turned out that Hezbollah and Iran were bluffing after all. The 50% probability here is that Israel does go into Gaza, full ground offensive. And it turns out that neither Iran nor Hezbollah were bluffing. Hezbollah enters the fray, the northern front ignites, and in fact, it could be more than one front because it's not just only the Lebanese-Israeli border. We're talking about the Golan Heights. And in fact, the possibility that Hezbollah, along with some Iraqi militias who's been quietly massing on the Golan Heights and the Lebanese-Israeli border in the past few weeks, which shows some degree of coordination, um, they could also open a front. And that is quite worrying because, in a sense, they could frame you know, their struggle as a struggle to liberate um, occupied land because they consider um, the Golan Heights uh, to be an occupied land. So they will frame their uh, so-called, you know, uh, new front this way. If you see, Hezbollah has been focusing a lot on some areas of disputed territory, you know, uh, Kafr Shuba Hills, uh, the Shiba Farms, you know, but, you know in, uh, incidentally, my mother is from Shiba, you know, uh, that's where, he, you know, she comes from. So, in a sense, we are going to see a lot of um, in a fronts opening on Israel from the Houthis in Yemen who already started harassing uh, the, um, you know, the uh, Israelis through the cruise missiles they were intending to hit them with, which were intercepted by uh, the American naval uh, USS ship, um, sorry, the USS uh, Kearney. Now, in if this scenario were to happen, I don't think that Iran will be directly involved initially. But who would be involved directly beside Israel? It will be the U.S. Because the U.S. backed themselves into a corner here. This is why I'm naming this, uh, you know, a Q&A uh, episode. Like, I mean, a game of corners. Instead of Game of Thrones, we are actually talking about Game of Corners. And why a Game of Corners? Because Everyone seems to have backed themselves into a corner. So the Israelis backed themselves into a corner. Hamas backed themselves into a corner. Hezbollah and Iran backed themselves into a corner. The Americans backed themselves into a corner. What are these corners? Because Hamas backed themselves into a corner when they have committed to attacking Israel in the manner that they have done, you know, thus provoking you know, a, the wrath of the biblical God, in a sense. And on the other hand, Israel back themselves into a corner by a declaration of war and a declaration that they cannot coexist anymore with Hamas, come what may. 
And the Americans backed themselves into a corner when they said that they will intervene if, if a third party were to enter the fray. Third party could be a state actor or non-state actor. That means Hezbollah, Iraqi militias in Iraq uh, and Syria, uh, the Assad regime, if they are stupid enough, um, as well as Iran, if they want to do directly, or the Houthis, if they think that their few long-range weapons could, could be a game changer, when in fact they could be easily intercepted by any of the um, US naval ships that carry the Aegis you know, air defense system, uh, which is designed specifically for this task. So this 50% probability is, you know, counting on the fact that the war will be confined to the Levant, you know, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, uh, as well as the Mediterranean waters, given that the US Navy and the aircraft carriers will be involved against a third party, namely Hezbollah. And then you have also the Iraqi milit militias uh, in Iraq targeting American bases in Iraq, like uh, Ain al-Assad and uh, Victoria camp in um, uh, Baghdad airport, as well as the, you know, as well as um, the uh, camps in Kurdistan, the KRG, the uh, Kurdistan Regional Government, as well as uh, in a TNF, uh, sorry, a TNF uh, uh, air base uh, and uh, the Umar oil field uh, in uh, Syria. So, in other words, we will end up having what we call the the fertile crescent. Um, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, going all the way down to Iraq. This fertile crescent will become the bloody crescent. Um, and the conflict could be confined to that. Now, you know, if you are good with math, and I hope you do, uh, and I hope you are, actually, um, you'll find that 20 plus 20 plus 50 is 90. So, amen, where is the uh, remaining 10%? Well, I spared the last 10% for the worst possible scenario here, uh, which I put a 10% probability in it, uh, hoping that cooler heads will prevail. Um, we are coming into winter after all, so sh should it dampen things down. But um, the 10% probability is that, let's say, for whatever stupidity or insanity uh, that takes over the Iranian regime's thinking, they do launch direct attack on the Israelis or the Americans in the region, or if indirectly, like, and I mean, the, uh, the Iranian proxies like Hezbollah um, and uh, the militias, they use uh, sophisticated and powerful Iranian-made weapons, uh, and they cause um, significant civilian and military casualties on the Israeli side, then Israel could, in theory, accuse Iran of a direct hit um, the U.S. could back Iran on, uh, sorry, back the Israelis on this, and then they attack the Iranians uh, in their own homeland, and Iranian targets are then, you know, uh, destroyed. And so, Iran could have two choices at the time: enter the fray directly, uh, attacking U.S. interests in Iraq and in Syria and in the Mediterranean, and also attacking Israel proper. That would be the least worrisome, you know, and there would be even more worrisome uh, scenario here, is that either the Iranians target U.S. military bases in the Gulf, uh, namely Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, UAE, or that Iraqi militias acting on behalf of Iran, Iran would attack Kuwaiti um, uh, base, uh, American bases there, or um, you know, the Iranians stage, you know, a, um, a, a, you know, a militant uprising in Bahrain, which they tried to do before in 2011. Now, all of these scenarios would trigger, naturally, the articles of the Peninsula Shield Treaty um, among the GCC countries in which one, if one country is attacked, the rest will come to the defense. It doesn't matter if the target is an American base or not. A territory has been attacked, and therefore Saudi Arabia will enter the conflict. Ho and I hope like this never happened, and then voila, we have a regional conflict. This is why we are stupidly <laughs> and insanely, uh, you know, walking into what I call the guns of August territory here. Guns of August territory. And I don't say this lightly. Um, you know, 
the Guns of Focus is a brilliant book published in the early 1960s. It was published in the United States by the author and historian Barbara Tuckman. And it talks about the first month or two of the breakout of the World War I. It's a brilliant book, and I definitely recommend it, definitely. It just talks about the mobilizations. Everyone is mobilizing. Everyone is mobilizing. The Americans are mobilizing now. The Israelis are mobilizing now. The Iranians are mobilizing. The Iraqis are mobilizing. Hezbollah is mobilizing. And the GCC militaries, all of them are on high alert. So we have everyone mobilizing. The irony is that this mobilizing is in order to deter the other from attacking, but actually it ended up, tragically, causing the other side to just shoot first and start this domino of declarations of war among the great powers, you know, you know Britain, France, Russia, Austrian, Hung the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and of course, uh, the German Empire at the time. And so it was all about great powers second guessing each other and trying to work out what are their intentions and what are, whether they're Red lines were bluffs or not, and that if you don't withdraw your declaration of war, I'm going to mobilize and I'm going to declare war on you. And then this is exactly what happened, the cascading domino of human stupidity. So um, without further ado, all I can tell you is that um, we are in a mess. And it would take a miracle to get out of it. And the best case scenario out of all of this is the second option is to leave Hezbollah and Hamas. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting old. Is to leave Israel and Hamas alone to fight it out, to slug it out to, you know, against each other in the Gaza arena and to just leave them alone to their own devices. Let them tear each other apart. Let them fight each other apart until one emerge as a victor and most likely to be Israel and let it be done, and no intervention by any third party whatsoever. Ironically, with all the tens of thousands of people who will be killed from both sides, this is the best option out of all of this. Thank you, Iran. And I'm being sarcastic about being thank you. I was, I meant to say damn you. Until the next question. <laughs>